Hello and welcome. I am Zabraxi. Do a little off to the side this time. So just a little while ago, I posted a poll on my channel asking people what they thought the best Golden Sun game was, and you all really chose that The Legend of Dragoon was a better Golden Sun game than Dark Dawn? It can't be that bad, right? Right? In our last episode, we went over everything that I could possibly come up with about Golden Sun, though I actually had to be far more careful with certain details than I typically would be when going over a series. You see, I played the original entry in the Golden Sun series long ago when I was just a teenager. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and revisiting it for this channel only added to my affection for that journey. However, I had never completed its sequel. In fact, before this episode, I had only touched the Lost Age for less than an hour total? I'd say that makes me pretty damn qualified to make this retrospective, huh? The original Golden Sun performed incredibly well. It even sold more than a Pokemon game. Oh, don't get too excited, it was Pokemon Pinball. But comparing anything to Pokemon just isn't fair. The top three selling titles for the Game Boy Advance are all Pokemon, and those three games sold more than the next 11 combined. Oh, and one of those 11? is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Still, Golden Sun accomplished an impressive feat by landing as the third best-selling RPG series on the GBA behind Pokemon and Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. In fact, if you combine Golden Sun and the Lost Ages sales, it moves up to the number two spot on that list. Imagine a brand new franchise, a JRPG no less, selling the same amount as a Mario game. Oh, actually, the first Golden Sun only sold about 100,000 units less than The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, a JRPG competing with Mario and Zelda. Wow! I mean, what would you do with Camelot after such an impressive achievement? Have them continue making sports games? <laughs> that, would, uh, that would be ridiculous. While the sales and reception was overwhelmingly positive for the Game Boy Advance's first JRPG, it's important to remember that there was also a dark side. See, many critics at the time praised the visuals, the music, the gameplay, all those aspects that define a fantastic title, but the story was far more contentious than we seem to remember in the modern day. There were two key issues that were repeated amongst many outlets and many circles. First was that the opening of Golden Sun was way too long and way too childish. Honestly, this is a pretty ridiculous claim. I'm often the first to defend an opposing viewpoint because any argument can have a basis in truth, even amongst subjective discussions. However, the point of childishness is always weird to me? Pokemon is childish, and the largest franchise of all time in the entire world, many of its fans even being adults. Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch is a phenomenal JRPG that is intentionally childish. Dragon Quest is childish due to its style and humor. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker is seen as childish because it uses a cel-shaded aesthetic. I don't want to get too caught up in this phrase, but the phrase childish being used as a derogatory term when describing an art form that in its entirety is often viewed as childish, it's just always been extremely pretentious of a claim to me. The fact that the intro was too long I mean, really? Seriously? It's made up of you walking around a town for like five to ten minutes and an intro dungeon. If you think walking around a town and doing dungeons is not interesting enough, then oh boy are you gonna hate Golden Sun. You might even hate it as much as Ryan. Our boy Ryan left a review claiming that Golden Sun was just a cheap ripoff of Pokemon back in the day. I mean, at least he gave it a one. Joking aside, there was a criticism that was levied quite a bit, and this was all about the ending. A new IP was just dropped onto the GBA, and it had the audacity to not even conclude its story. Not even in a way where the plot naturally created new conflicts along the way that would now go unanswered, which led the player to feel sequel baited by the end of the experience. No, Golden Sun opened with its plot told to you to stop the four lighthouses from being lit, you visit two of those four, and the game ends. I remember vividly that the first time I hit the ending to Golden Sun, I thought something was wrong. I was actually playing it on an emulator at the time and figured I had a bad ROM. So I traded in some games, picked up a physical copy of Golden Sun, played through the entire thing again, and boom, end credits. Well, that sucks. 
I didn't feel ripped off or anything like that, other than the games I had just traded in, but the whole ending just felt odd and abrupt. It felt incomplete. Imagine if Final Fantasy just simply ended at the second elemental crystal. It was just weird. The experience was a blast, and everything about that time was so fun. Golden Sun was a beautiful quest for the player, and one clearly made by veterans of the genre. But the move to end here, in the way that Camelot did, left a rather sour taste in the mouth of many players and critics alike. It would be then a couple years later when that confusion would turn to excitement as Nintendo unveiled Golden Sun, The Lost Age. Video game sequels were nothing new by this point. Lost Age was hardly the first and would nowhere be the last, yet what the Lost Age did do was definitely rather unique to sequels of all forms of media. To start a subsequent experience immediately after the events of the first is incredibly rare. There's a reason why to even this day, the opening of Sonic 3 is praised as it takes the outro scene of Sonic 2 and then 3 opens, not after, but during that exact same scene into a brand new adventure. Golden Sun The Lost Age would try its own hand at this approach, but take it even a step further. Our introduction to this quest doesn't start directly at the end of the original game, as many would lead you to believe. In fact, the opening here kicks off in the events just before the finale of the original. Starting with Jenna and Kraden, the old one, we are trying to escape down the lighthouse while Felix and Alex assist Minard and Saturos in completing the mission of lighting the Venus Lighthouse. Isaac, Garrett, Ivan, and Mia are all still making their way up the tower at this point, while Jenna and Kraden, the old one, are heading off to get started on the next part of the task. During this descent, the final battle of the first game kicks off as the original party battles it out against Minardi and Saturos at the very top. When the player leaves the lighthouse, they are greeted with resistance, and this is also the first time we actually get to see some of the true power of Alex. This Mercury Adept is so much beyond anyone we've seen in the series thus far in terms of power. After you see his potential, we make our way out as puny little level 5 Jenna as we push our way to the boat to prepare to embark to the next lighthouse. There's a really cute detail here where Jenna has her own battle theme, the same as Isaac and Felix. It's a fun track for sure, and it only shows itself briefly during this intro section, which is a real shame, because seriously, it's great. While waiting for the return of Felix, Minardi, and Saturos, the lighthouse gets lit, and the world reacts violently. The landform the party is on actually fragments as the geographical landscape of the world ruptures and shifts, even propelling entire land masses to different locations. Behold the potential power of alchemy in the world of Wayard. While the intro in the Lost Age is less eventful and less emotional than the first game, it's still really cool in that it flips the expectations on the player. Imagine you played the first game, and now you're leaving Isaac and the gang to play Felix and the antagonists. You also have this cool antithetical moment where in the original opening for the first Golden Sun, you have Isaac trying desperately to protect and save Jenna as she needs his assistance, whereas now, Jenna is outright trying to outrun and get away from Isaac as fast as possible. And the cool thing is that as the player, there's no real way to see this shift coming. Imagine yourself playing the original game and then seeing ads and trailers for the new one coming out, and you're now playing as the party that you're currently fighting against. Well, imagining is about all you could do because the advertising for the Lost Age was really bad. Summon great forces in Golden Sun, the Lost Age. Ready to be for everyone. Did you see it? Did you see the gameplay? I hope you didn't blink, because I swear to you, there was some gameplay there. I thought you were going to summon some wind. Shut up! To pull back the curtains for a moment, because I had never played through the original Lost Age when doing that original Golden Sun retrospective, I did everything in my power to avoid spoilers. 
I also want to give a huge shout out to everyone who reached out and commented on suggestions and pointers going into this episode. Basically, all the tips and advice I had received was spoiler free or ambiguous enough that I'd not be able to piece spoilers together, even if they were said. It's allowed me to give this an honest first look, then being able to deep dive after my initial playthrough. You all are seriously awesome even though some of you actually voted for Legend of Dragoon as the best Golden Sun game. I'm not going to get over that for quite a while. In a way, the transition to playing as Felix and co would be seen as predictable. All the way back to the beginning of the original Golden Sun, the wise one hinted at Felix being the effective chosen one. I really wondered about this in the first game. Why does the wise one send Isaac on a journey to stop Felix from letting the lighthouses if Felix is the one who's actually on the right path? This is a question I raised then in my original video that the Lost Age would eventually answer, but in the meantime, this entire island is getting launched through the ocean. Oh lord, are we on a lion turtle from Avatar? Oh, and look, we've actually found Felix and Sheba. Uh, really? Okay, so the original game's cut to the title screen was about as perfect as it could have been. Following a tragic introduction and a loss against the primary villains, that transition perfectly encapsulated the passage of time that occurred while simultaneously playing into the common practice of loading to the main menu upon a game over. It was a tease and a narrative tool all at the same time. I can't say I was expecting the same level of perfection from the Lost Age, but this this, what an odd time to cut to the title screen. Did the team forget to make a transition between these scenes so they just decided this instead? I mean it seriously, anything could have been done better than this, anything. What if instead we cut to the title screen immediately after the giant tidal wave hits? The timing would have been better, the transition of time would have worked well, the mystery of what the heck is going on would have landed, and we all could have just seen it as a title screen instead of a title screen. <laughs> yeah, it would have been the same gimmick twice, but it still would have been a much more effective passage of time than this. It's also important to note, and we will continue to break into examples of this, but the Lost Age is very different from the original in many, many ways. As the journey progresses, we end up with a party of four playable characters, as well as Kraden, the old guy. We have Felix, the Venus Adept, and New Isaac, Jenna, the Mars Adept, and all-around Red Mage, Sheba, the Mind Raider, and Piers, the probably 100-year-old in an 18-year-old's body, and then we have Kraden the old one. Most of the narrative is not what you'd expect here. Remember how the first game was all about the lighthouses and the return of alchemy? Well, the Lost Age still has that stuff in it, but it's pretty much abandoned after the first hour or so and then reintroduced at about the 25 to 30 hour mark. Yeah, getting to the lighthouses is harder than setting light to the dang things apparently. Instead, the current goals now are to expand the party's synergy potential by overcoming the elemental rocks and getting to Lemuria, totally not Atlantis. Whereas the original games at the stage for the four elemental lighthouses, the Lost Age focuses on locations called elemental rocks, locations that are imbued with overwhelming amounts of particular elemental magic. Air's rock for Jupiter, Gaia rock for Venus, Magma rock for Mars, and Aqua rock for Mercury. While at first this comes out as a bit of a whiplash from the lighthouse plot, these locations, as well as many others, would show off the capabilities of Lost Age's game design, which we'll explore later. The perspective from this party is radically different than that from the original. Original. Isaac's party felt like they were unsure of themselves regularly, and a major boon on that journey was watching them develop the confidence to overcoming amazing opposition. Felix, Jenna, Sheba, and Piers, on the other hand, are far more confident in their task. They know what must be done, and are driven to execute that plan. Even when doubt arises, such as Sheba's questioning of her purpose in the world, this theme of perseverance and acceptance of oneself permeates constantly. We also see this in the diversity of the world within Wayard. Golden Sun did a masterful job of establishing different cultures across the world who had their own traditions and even names for their own magic of synergy. The Lost Age decided that Golden Sun just didn't do a good enough job, so it just piles on more and more new customs. Take the people of Kibombo, for example. You end up chasing down Piers as he's attempting to steal back an orb from the leader of the tribe. By this point, you've discovered that this black orb is actually 
you the power source and control unit for the ship that you'll need to enter Lemuria. Totally not Atlantis. Well, the people of Kibombo are trying to perform a ritual with the Gobomba statue to appoint a new witch doctor. The tribe is engaging in a ritual to bestow upon their leader a divine boon from their idol. While this alone mimics real world tribes outright, it also conveys that this magic isn't a heavenly blessing, but synergy. It's just a form of magic that many others are all too experienced with. Even Kraden, the old one. Actually, Kraden gets an amazing moment here. The spirit of the great Gabomba goes to bestow the power to the witch doctor, but in a moment of excitement, the witch doctor runs out before he can be given his full gift. Not only does this leave the Gabomba spirit confused, but then Kraden just straight up asks if the party can get the power instead, since they have stuff to do. <laughs> what an amazing moment. Oh, and the music for the Gabomba statue. Oh, it's just such a fun jam. And it's not just cultures and traditions that are used creatively though. One of my favorite sections in the whole game comes from this village called Giro. Upon stumbling into the town, you see a humanoid wolf running in the center of the village and the team becomes curious and tries to investigate. Everyone in the town is acting super suspicious, but also basically telling you nothing at all. If you haven't been using the mind read synergy, then this is the big hint to start using it regularly. Once you start mind reading people, the whole situation changes drastically. These people aren't trying to shove you off because they're ignoring you. Not at all. In fact, they're terrified of Felix and the gang. Before too long, you start to connect that to the north of the village, there's something special, what ends up being the dungeon Air Rock, in which Sheba learns the powerful synergy known as Reveal. Heading back to Garo and using Reveal, you can find the secret entrance to the village elder, and eventually you learn all about their culture and history of these people. While everyone here is a werewolf, they're not bloodthirsty, rather nervous of scaring others who might find them to be freaks. I already liked this town for the creative use of storytelling. The lack of clear direction with the critical path only being discovered with some serious investigation really gives the Lost Age this feeling of being more of a traditional and mature JRPG than the original game, which is clearly intended to be more of an introductory to the genre. What really sunk its teeth into me though, really? Wolf puns? Okay, other me, if you want to make some wolf puns, then bounce them off me. Let's make sure they're really good. What really packs this all together? No. What really wraps this tail up nicely? Next. What helped make the end of this a bit less rough? Seriously? Every dog must have his day. That's just a common phrase. This old dog actually taught me a new trick. Just stop. I, I can't keep doing this. It it's too rough. Ah, oh, damn it! The final moments of Garo secure that message of acceptance that I mentioned prior. When the party is puzzled by how such a curse can exist, the leader of the village poses an interesting idea. He's of the belief that lycanthropy is just but another evolutionary branch. If other animals can change their shape for survival, then why not humans? What makes the transition of a caterpillar to the butterfly any different than a human to a werewolf? Honestly, I was stunned when playing through this moment. What a brilliant line of questioning. What an absolutely amazing perspective change. This conversation in the Lost Age is one of the most mature, reasonable, and potent conversations about the topic of self-acceptance that I've seen in video games in a long while. While the dialogue can be very eye-opening, something impressive about the Lost Age is that all of this content in the first part of the game is only about half of the whole world. This eastern side of the divide is pretty large, but inevitably the Lost Age opens up to the entire world of Wayard. The crew is even equipped to the ship and eventually it can levitate. How cool is that? Yet again, these larger staples of the genre have now made their way into the Golden Sun franchise, further emphasizing the introductory mindset of the first game into the maturity of mechanics in the Lost Age. Much of this adventure can be explored to your heart's content and trust me, you'll be doing a lot of aimlessly wandering around if you're bad at intuiting the next step like I am. While not too many times, I can think of at least three or so times that I was outright stuck. Actually, all three of those moments were part of the same primary quest where you have to craft a trident to take down Poseidon. Yeah, the actual god of the sea himself is a boss that you have to overcome if you hope to see the great city of Lemuria. 
totally not Atlantis. See, in order to even make it to him, you have to navigate these whirlpools. While pretty cryptic, you can brute force your way through this puzzle with some trial and error. Granted, there is actually a pretty big hidden hidden somewhere in the game. In the town of Yalom, directly south of the Sea of Time where the whirlpools are, you'll stumble upon this group of kids. If you talk to them, they'll sing you a song and walk you through each part of the song, which will clearly set a pattern to something very important. Well, that pattern is actually the pathway through the Sea of Time itself. Again, while a very cleverly hidden hint, you won't really need it to succeed. The pathway can be guessed after enough tries, and the spinning around volcanoes to progress might sound cryptic on paper, but the visual feedback is pretty obvious. But something to note is that Yalom, while being incredibly important because of the blacksmith, is actually an optional town that you can just outright skip over, potentially meaning that you'll never see the song or the children. In fact, the entire quest to craft the trident for Poseidon was so confusing to me. You're given the boat, and now Camelot had just expected you to feel compelled to explore every square inch of the Eastern Sea with very little direction. I'm not personally against ambiguity in quest design. In fact, I just praised the game for requiring some clever detective work with Garo, but no, this quest is pretty different. What you have to do is travel to every single island in the entire Eastern Sea. Each one gives you a slight hint on where to get each of these three trident pieces. Some of these hints are insanely cryptic and borderline useless. In fact, some of them are so useless that I ended up spending hours and hours stumbling my way across the world and ended up finding two of the three trident pieces, but I didn't know what they were even for, even after I had found the hints. Yeah, I had pieces of this trident that are critical to beating the game, but I didn't even know what these items were or that I needed them to craft a trident. In fact, I only finally stumbled upon the hint that I should make the dang thing and that you should be making a trident to fight Poseidon after I had already beaten Poseidon and was at the end of the game doing optional side content. I love exploring around worlds of RPGs and trying to find out where to go next. Being forced to look a bit deeper into the world is something I wish more games would do, but I was just so stuck at this part. Hours and hours and hours went by, and I couldn't figure out where to go or what to do. So after several wasted evenings, I did what any reasonable person would have done way earlier. I booted up my Dreamcast, I launched Web Browser 2.0 with SegaNet, and I bought myself a strategy guide. So if it's not been made already clear, The Lost Age is pretty different in a lot of ways to the first game. The narrative is significantly less straightforward, but that moment with the trident is more of an exception to the rule in this regard. The Lost Age often gives you a strong nudge on where to go, and when it works, you feel super accomplished. However, the narrative structure is hardly the only difference between the two games. In fact, where the Lost Age differentiates itself most is mechanically. And Golden Sun The Lost Age is absolutely legendary in this capacity. When I first played Golden Sun all those years ago, I remember loving the characters and so much about the world. The graphical presentation still blows me away to this day, and the djinn were a fun little gimmick that helped the world of Wired and its mechanics have a sense of individuality compared to all of the other JRPGs that were getting pumped out at the time. You see, the thing is, I was one of those many players who had experienced a ton of these JRPGs on the market by this point. You have to remember that Final Fantasy IX, this legendary masterpiece, had already released by this point. Quest 64 existed, and The Legend of Dragoon had finally come out and cultivated this devout, loyal fan base that I too am a part of. In fact, I actually write to Sony each and every month, letting them know how much I want a sequel, and I try to be as polite about it as possible. I'm just doing my part. One of the downsides to the original Golden Sun is that if you were a veteran of the genre, there were definitely elements that felt a bit less interesting because you've already been exposed to them by this point. This is where the Lost Age steps in and changes all of that. First off, confession moment. I didn't even know there was a class system to Golden Sun until I covered it for the retrospective that I just did. 
Yeah, I'm that dumb, and I still think my opinion is worth sharing for some reason. The thing is though, I knew different gin makeups would change the base energy available, but until I started overanalyzing every element of the game for the sake of an over 40 minute long video, I had no clue that this had further consequences than that. Part of the reason I, and judging by comments and online posts, many others didn't know this class system existed is that the pacing of the gin acquisition was potentially too structured. You'd get Venus, then Mars, then Jupiter, then Mercury, then Venus, then Mars, then whoa, Mercury first and then a Jupiter? Whoa, I almost got whiplash here from that shakeup. The Lost Age, on the other hand, gives you Jin at such a seemingly random rate and pace, and honestly, it's such a step up from the original. It's practically impossible to monotype your adepts with their own elemental Jin because you might only get Mars and Jupiter Jin for like five in a row. In fact, I'm pretty sure at one point I didn't get a Venus Jin until like eight or more gin deep. While it felt a bit odd, it also forced me to utilize characters in ways that I might not normally have done. I have now grown a love for Astro Blast. That move is nuts. But the Lost Age not only forced me to do so in exploring these new ideas, but because of that, it opened up my mind to the possibilities that I had never considered. This compounds even further when you see just how many dang gin there are. The first game had 28 of the little buggers. The Lost Age has a couple more with 44, almost double. And no, it's not 44 total with 28 from the first game. It's 44 new gin that can be discovered in the world. 24 of the 28 can be transferred from the original game, and four of the 28 can be found within the Lost Age itself if they weren't discovered in a transferred save. So yeah, you did the math, right? Uh, who am I kidding? Who did the math? But that means there's 72 total gin that exist to be found and utilized, all with their own skills. There's only some slight crossover of abilities too, mind you. Some Jin from the first game do have the same ability as some from the Lost Age, but that still doesn't change the insane level of customization. Finding all of the little spirits can be incredibly difficult, and some are especially tucked away. You really have to think outside the box on a few of these, or have to pay some insane attention to detail here. There's even this moment that I had originally thought was a bit too secretive, but after sitting on it, I feel so creative for piecing everything together on my own. So. Here's the setup. You can see this Mars Jin from a certain angle, but the only way to get to it is clearly from a cave exit, but the entrance is nowhere to be found. The only way to find the way to the cave is to talk to the little boy who indicates that he has a secret somewhere in the backyard. When you go behind the house, there's just some dirt and a chicken. Well, if you mind read the chicken, it mentions how the ground around them is soft and fun to scratch and dig at. Bingo! Use the scoop synergy around the sand and eventually you'll stumble upon an entrance to the cave that leads you right to the Mars Gen. The Lost Age loves to flirt with this line of frustrating and clever ambiguity, but moments like this are so well crafted and the journey is littered with these types of old school RPG puzzles. Though I did get pretty stuck on quite a few of them and you need every single gin in order to unlock all the optional endgame content, but, but, I can proudly say, I never once looked up a single one of them on the internet. I used a strategy guide. Oh, and since I mentioned the save transfers, yeah, you can transfer your save files from the original Golden Sun into the Lost Age. It's really cool. You can do this in a couple different ways too. For example, if you have two Game Boy Advances, you can just hook them up with a link cable and boom, just transfer the saves. But since I was playing on the Wii U, which by the way, has some of the most perfect emulation I've ever seen, but pretty expected by the team that made it, M2. Pretty legendary. There's another way to do this transfer using a password. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. By password, I mean five pages of random characters. All right, we got this. Another point. One step closer to death. Questioning my life. Still going. That grave is looking real close. And there. Finally. Pass phrase completed. I want off this ride. Thankfully, when you finally complete entering the entire password a second time, and correctly this time, you are capable of transferring over 
everything from the first game. This includes all of the original party's levels, experience, gin, the specific gin equipped, amount of gold, items equipped, and even narrative decisions that will pop up in the Lost Age. This is such a perfect way to handle a direct sequel. We wouldn't have these types of mechanics popularized until Bioware implemented similar features in the Dragon Age and Mass Effect franchises about a decade later. Golden Sun was truly ahead of its time. For example, there's this one moment where a girl bumps into the party looking for Isaac. At first, I recognized the young lady, but I didn't remember her name. Well, this is Feijji? Feijji? I don't know how to pronounce her name. But she's from the first game, and if you helped her out, she ends up not just admiring Isaac for his bravery, but falls in love with him. She then travels the world trying to give Isaac a good luck charm that she made called the Golden Ring, which is a pretty dang good defensive item, by the way. She'll give you the item for agreeing to deliver it to Isaac, but this whole interaction won't even happen unless you helped her in the first game. Seriously, a sequel done right here. Going over all of the callbacks and references in The Lost Age could seriously be a video in its own right. That fact in itself helps to show just how important the developers felt connecting the two games was. Potentially the greatest connection that a sequel can derive is the increase in complexity and challenge for the dungeons than the original. From very early on, you'll be more challenged in your way of handling synergy than the first game ever had you. Puzzle solving, dungeon navigation, and synergy energy execution is just so much more advanced this time around. This might be a bit odd if you don't play these two games back to back, but journeying through both experiences in close succession helps The Lost Age not just feel like a sequel, but almost a post game of Golden Sun. All of the synergy uses are a compounding of information and creativity that the player had to exercise in the first game. This comes in many forms, such as using Whirlwind to swing across vines, using Blast on statues to make them erupt and blast open new pathways, to use Sand to navigate across terrain that you normally couldn't have before. Many of the new synergies are still focused on a limited one-purpose problem-solving, but many of their niche alone require the player to think in ways that most RPGs would never come close to entertaining. Returning abilities also get used more creatively. For example, Mind Read is significantly more critical in The Lost Age. Yeah, I'm bringing up Mind Read again. It's my favorite synergy, and it's so unique, and I love it. In the original Golden Sun, Mind Read was mostly used to provide extra thematic context to the world and helped flesh out the intentions of characters and their personalities. The Lost Age continues this, but also forces you to use Mind Read far more aggressively. Many hints to the critical path are hidden in the minds of NPCs. Granted, if you don't find the mind reading as fun as I do, this could definitely lead to some frustration, but more objectively, this is a mechanic that provides Golden Sun a sense of identity. The cliche of talking to everyone in a JRPG still exists here, sure, but mind reading allows the developers the creativity to expose the more two-faced nature of people in Wayard, which easily represents us all in the real world as well. Not all of it is malicious, mind you, but what we say and what we think is often at odds, even down to the question of how are you doing today? How often do you answer good when your day has been pretty crappy? These synergy uses in dungeons are stretched out quite a bit further. Each synergy and every conceivable use it might have is extracted to the final drop. So much creativity here is exercised and we get to see everything that these abilities have to offer. This is about 95% a compliment, because the curse is that some of these mechanics are also overused quite a bit. For example, the fun use of Whirlwind to swing across vines that I mentioned earlier is used a lot of times in the game. Like, a lot of times. Okay, fine, it can just be a gimmick that overstays its welcome, and that's a little lame, but how annoying can it really be? Very. Dungeons can require so many different synergies to be used, and many of them on repeat over and over and over again. This sounds like that creative use of the skills that I just mentioned, right? So what's the problem? Did you ever play Ocarina of Time or know about the Water Temple? Outside from being the most hated dungeon in that game, which is a shame because I'm personally in the camp that thinks it's great, but easily the complaint that is fully warranted is having to switch to the menu and unequip and re-equip the iron boots every 30 seconds or so. Well, <sighs> Golden Sun has the same problem here. Whirlwind, for example, can only be learned by a Jupiter adept. 
Sheba in this case, who is part of the Windseer class line. That class line is when Sheba has only Jupiter Jin active. Remember how I mentioned earlier that you can almost never mono Jin equip in the Lost Age? Well, here's a downside to that. You constantly have to go into the menu, navigate to the Jin for Sheba, and put all non Jupiter Jin on standby use Whirlwind, and then if you use a summon and she recovers those Jin, you have to remember to go back into the menu and put them on standby again. This becomes an even more conflated problem when you factor in that the Lost Age now adds hidden multi-Jin summons. They're incredibly powerful with their own potential, like status effects, healing, and multi-elemental power gains. These are a net positive to the experience and makes the world even more exciting to explore. But in context to using synergies to solve problems, they only make you forget which Jin is now on standby and which is active. You sometimes have to navigate the menu for Jin allotment to get certain synergies, sometimes 30 plus times a dungeon, sometimes several times within a minute or so, depending on the puzzle that you're currently working on. While this is clearly annoying, I don't actually feel too comfortable leaving it as strictly a negative. It's more a limitation of the Jin system and the limited number of buttons on the Game Boy Advance. The Lost Age has incredibly long and complex dungeons that force the player to use synergies in incredible ways. If the consequence to this is that I have to be annoyed by menus sometimes, then fine. It's not great, but I like the puzzle solving far more than I hate the menu navigation. Though, perhaps certain utility synergy could be permanently unlocked to their respective adept as a potential future solution, and maybe only on rare occasions to find hidden treasure or gin would call for a different gin assignment to unlock certain synergy. It's just an idea I had, what do you think? The Lost Age has a pivotal point about two-thirds of the way into the game. Much of your journey isn't actually about the lighthouses, but in fact, it's focused immensely on getting to Lemuria, totally not Atlantis. There's a lot of reason for this, but most importantly, it's that the people of this ancient, totally not Atlantis city might know what Minardi and Saturos were so hellbent on returning alchemy to begin with. In fact, this is about the time that you realize that there are multiple actors setting the stage for Alchemy's return. The next key moments of the Lost Age consist of exploring Lemuria, totally not Atlantis, and then lighting the final two lighthouses. So much happens here that changes the context of this entire adventure. So let's hit a few, shall we? First is that the Lemurians, peers included, have become aware that Wayard is dying. In fact, the planet is dying at an alarming rate. The world is losing its land formations and the water is rushing off the side of the planet. Where the critical problem seems to be is that without alchemy, Wayard is unable to restore itself at the same pace it once was. So all in all, planet dying means super bad for anything on said planet. Got it, fair, okay, I can get behind this one. So this is now a save the world story, cool. Well, it's not quite that easy. What about Felix and Jenna? Why did they decide to help Minardi and Saturos in the last game, but we're only now finding out that the world is dying? Well, that's because that wasn't their intention, because all of those people who died in the opening of Golden Sun, yeah, they're not actually dead. In fact, they were saved by Minardi and Saturos and are being held hostage to leverage Jenna and Felix to execute on this task. This is a little weird, as it definitely removes much of the initial impact from the first game. I still think that the opening of Golden Sun is one of the best starts to an RPG ever, potentially a game ever. Unfortunately, what makes it so impactful is the sheer devastation of it. I'm torn here, I really am. This is such an easy motivator for Jenna and Felix, forcing you to act against your will to save your loved ones is such an easy solution, but that might be the problem here. It's too easy and it risks undoing all of the weight from the original. Granted, I'm not sure if knowing this actually lessens the impact from the opening of the original, because still, the first time you play Golden Sun, it will leave you speechless with just how much goes wrong. Okay, anyway, so we have the world ending and Felix and Jenna's parents held against their will, but what about Minardi and Saturos to begin with? Why would they do such a thing to obtain this power? 
Is it for power's sake? Or is it possibly because their home village is on the edge of the world as the planet is dying and their entire civilization will end up dead unless they find a way to return alchemy to the world? Yes, it's that one. Sure, Minority and Saturos were kind of nasty people, that's still the case. What they had, though, was a critical task that would save so many lives, and their entire culture's existence was at stake. So they did everything and anything to get the results they wanted. Kidnapping and murder would be but a means to an end in their eyes. When the party finally shows up to the town of Prox, we are quick to realize how flipped the narrative is that we've experienced versus the real deal. These people aren't evil like you'd expect, they're desperate for survival. At the end of the day, the only one who seems like a complete asshole without any reason would be Alex. His desire to return alchemy is driven by his knowledge that when all the lighthouses are lit, it will trigger a massive energy spike known as the Golden Sun event. Oh, after 20 long years of playing the original game, I finally know what the heck a Golden Sun is. Neat. In fact, many of the events are just a big setup so that Alex can be in the right spot at the right time to absorb the energy and have that limitless power. Easily, my favorite part of the Lost Age, though, comes at the Jupiter Lighthouse. You are assisting two characters, Karst and Agatio, with igniting the lighthouse, and you discover that Isaac and the gang are right behind you. Eventually, you stumble upon Karst and Agatio trying to stop and kill Isaac and co, which is great because they're being stopped and all. But Felix, the party, and Kraden, the old one, all agree that death should not be the goal here. Through some circumstances and a boss fight, both parties agree to meet back in town and have it out in some good old conversation. Isaac agrees that Felix is in the right, and the two parties join. Yeah, I had been wondering if this was going to happen the entire game. I was hoping. This is awesome! Not only are both teams with you narratively, but you now have eight playable characters to choose from. Even better is that you can swap out each character in battle on each individual action, giving you a whole lot of options to play with. Another mechanic presents itself here, which is pretty cool. See, if the party of four on the screen dies, you don't game over anymore. Instead, the remaining four off screen hop in to help finish the fight. This radically opens up so many different gameplay opportunities and strategies to employ against the final bosses of the game. Oh, and do you remember that code we entered into the game a while back? That one that transferred everything from the first game? Well, when Isaac's party joined, color me surprised to see that even my equipment loadout from the first game was there fully intact. It's so great. It's never not gonna be awesome that they did this. However, real quick, before we hit upon the ending, which we're just about at, I wanna jump into the optional endgame stuff first. The Lost Age has four optional endgame dungeons. Each has a super boss at the very end, and three of the four have a djinn hidden inside. These final dungeons are brutal. They are easily the hardest parts of the game. Even the general random encounters have the ability to obliterate your entire party if you're slacking around. They aren't long by any stretch, but they're packed with unique puzzles and challenging encounters. The first of these four that I personally tackled was the Sea of Time Islet Cave, which held the boss Sentinel at the end. He's easily the simplest of the four, and the only real challenge about him is that his health pool is pretty large, and the fact that he's completely immune to Synergy. Not all that big of a deal when you can make up for this with Jin usage and summons, but defeating him yields the wonderful Catastrophe Summon, which... It's just absurd. Check this thing out.
Next, I made my way to the Yampi Desert and attempted Valukar for the Daedalus summon. There's not a lot to say about Valukar other than he's a brute. The primary gimmick of this encounter is that he can use an ability called Jin Stun, which will place a bunch of Jin on standby from your party. He will then use these Jin to execute the move Crucible, allowing him access to all available summons that you also have available to you with your Jin on standby. It can be a bit tough, but it's not too bad at the end of the day. Third was Treasure Isle. Not only is this place living up to its name with all the damn chests everywhere, but the final boss rewards you with the Azul Summon, which is incredibly potent. This particular super boss is easily the most complex encounter in the entire game. The Star Magician can summon four different types of orbs that provide him a benefit in some way. Thunderballs use AoE lightning attacks, Refresh Balls can cure and heal the Star Magician by up to a thousand points of health each, Anger Balls can just deal a ton of damage, and the Guardian Balls have the ability to put Guard on the Star Magician, reducing all damage that he takes for that turn by 95%. This encounter becomes a constant judgment call about how much damage it will take to kill one of the orbs, while trying to sneak in as much damage as possible into the Magician himself. After some trickery and puzzle solving, eventually he goes down and Azul is yours. Now this final encounter takes place in a location called the Animus Inner Sanctum. And in order to even access the Inner Sanctum itself, you have to have collected all of the Jinn in the first game, transferred them to the Lost Age, and then found all subsequent Jinn in this journey. Yeah, 72 Jinn you need in order to get everything just to be able to access this dungeon. Now, obviously, you could just look them all up online, which begs the question, why did I buy this? The final super boss against Julahan is brutal. He can block Synergy on a party member, curse a target to die in seven turns, cast Condemn to instantly one-shot someone, change his elemental alignment, and even cast Jin Storm, which puts every single Jin across your entire party on standby. He also has access to the strongest synergy in the game, Formina Sage, which he uses quite often. Oh, fun note actually, but Formina Sage is actually a mistranslation, and the actual name of the ability should be Fulminous Edge. The more you know. Oh, and also the more you know, did you know that this game was helped translated by Bill Trinan? Yeah, that Bill Trinan from Nintendo. I knew I knew that name from somewhere when I saw the credits, it's kinda cool. Oh, and did I mention that he can summon the second most powerful summon in the entire game? Oh my god, this thing is insanely devastating and can easily result in a party wipe. After an incredibly long and drawn out battle or a brutal summon rush strategy that I ended up having to use to win, eventually Dulahan falls and now you have access to the strongest summon available, Iris. This summon is absolutely stupid, by the way. I, I, I mean, just look at this thing. She launches enemies into a star. Neat. The ending of the base campaign is rather interesting. When you finally make it atop the Mars Lighthouse, you're stopped by the Wise One, who tests you one last time. He throws a boss at you known as the Doom Dragon, but there's a really big catch this time that Kraden, the old one, is trying to warn the party. In classic teenager fashion, the crew ignores the old guy and fights the dragon anyway. This encounter is brilliantly consisted of three smaller phases that reset the health pool each transition. This limits the player's ability to summon rush the encounter, and instead, you kinda have to fight it out pretty normally. It has access to a chunk of Venus and Mars synergy, it can cure itself, and it can curse kill a party member. However, the big moves are Jin Blast, yes, similar to Duel and Cruel Ruin, which becomes active once phase two triggers. Cruel Ruin hurts so badly. It's a skill that Doom Dragon uses pretty liberally, and this thing has the same damage multiplier as Iris. Yeah, this boss ability has the same damage multiplier as the strongest summon in the entire game. This is definitely not an easy fight and requires a lot of preparation and Jenna to just keep AoE spamming heals. Oh, and when you win though, oh, it feels so good. Finally, after 80 hours of Golden Sun gameplay, the dragon is defeated, the lighthouses are lit, and we find out that the Doom Dragon was actually Felix and Jenna's parents fused with Isaac's father all along. Well, that's unfortunate.
We also have Alex trying to grab all of the power of the Golden Sun for himself, only to get wrecked by the Wise One who beat him to it. I mean, this man quite literally gets sucked into the earth by a collapsing mountain. Jeez. Oh, and also all of the parents are fine, thanks to the incredible amount of synergy magic that erupted, which helped them recover. The game ends on the party and parents and Kraden the Old One heading back to Vale, reuniting with the town and their family. Not only is this a pretty touching ending considering the lengthy journey that it's been on and also how dark it could have gone, but this is some seriously beautiful pixel art. And with that, our adventure comes to a close. This adventure may have started with Isaac and the crew trying to stop Felix from returning alchemy to the world, but like our own lives, we have to be adaptable in the face of new information and events. I think back on just how confident Isaac has to be in his own actions to transition his purpose and go against everything he stood for prior because all he had now seen before him in the world. It was like watching a sheltered and structured child be sent off into the world to make his own judgment call on what he had witnessed. There is so much good in Golden Sun and its sequel. It's a coming of age story as these teenagers are set out to do great things, all of them compelled by their own reasons and virtues, and in the end, overcome all of their limitations to change the world in ways they never had thought possible. The world of Weyard is a wonderful mirror of our own reality with our own cultures and traditions, but we all also share the same fundamentals of the human experience, even if we might call these elements by different names. The team over at Camelot formed a journey that welcomed new players to the genre with the original, while then testing them greatly in its sequel. This might just be the greatest first and second games of a series I've yet to have played. This handoff between the two is just so masterful, both narratively and mechanically. When you combine this with the absolute magic that is Matoi Sakuraba's soundtrack, we get a truly fantastical experience that I was not prepared for. I'm not trying to overhype Golden Sun, as I do tend to be pretty positive at the end of most of my videos, but I think it's important for me to share exactly how I feel in the moment when I write this. To me, Right now, these two games have skyrocketed into my favorites of all time list. I don't know exactly where they stand numerically, but I love them. This journey, these two retrospective videos, sent me back on that childlike experience that I remember having all those years ago, but this time, I got to have it as an adult. This was my first venture through the Lost Age, and I have been transformed into a super fan of the series. I can't stop watching videos on these games. I can't stop listening to the soundtrack. I can't stop thinking about all of the class and synergy combinations that I might not have discovered yet. To me, that's the best response I can have from going on such a fun and thought-provoking experience. I feel genuinely changed by my time playing these games, making these episodes, and chatting with you all. That's the best feeling I could ever ask for. So thank you, Golden Sun, for bringing all of us adepts together to share our own experiences with one another. Now, if only we could get a remaster or a fourth game. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, Camelot is still around. They could do it. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed, and I hope you stick around for all the other content that I'm about to make, and that's on its way, because eventually, we are gonna get to Golden Sun Dark Dawn, because you all seem to really hate this game. Now I'm curious, but don't worry, I'm not gonna make the same mistake I just made for this last one. I've already bought the strategy guide, I'm ready to go. Bye bye